Well, thank you everyone for coming. I know it was a little bit tough because it's a Friday on a long weekend, but I really appreciate you coming. Um, this is a, a really good turnout and I see a lot of business owners out, out here. Um, so uh, I just wanna give you a little background on this and then I'm gonna step out of the way and let the experts do their presentation. Um, the town, um, as many of you know, because you were part of the process, went through a master plan process, um, which all towns do. Um, and you're supposed to update them like every 10 years or so. Um, so we updated ours and actually Daphne was the, uh, took the lead on updating and it was an incredibly good master plan. And I've looked at a lot of master plans in my career and it was not a cookie cutter one. It was very heavy on outreach um, and it was very um, customized to this town. I was very impressed with it. So one of the many recommendations of that master plan was that we then move on to a very in-depth um, economic development plan that we could use as sort of a blueprint to um, uh, you know, do kind of um, increase the vitality of the town. Um, so um, we got a grant for that. And when I came on board um, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we had received the grant and then um, we ended up hiring Daphne and her, um, well actually our KG Associates, sorry. Um, and then they, um, because they're economic development experts, and he can give you a little bit of background about um, their uh, consulting firm. And then so we have um, RKG Associates, um, Eric Halverson, and then Daphne Politis with Community Circle, and then another individual that we think is still stuck on the highway somewhere, we hope he's okay, um, Mark Faverman. His expertise is community development and he's an artist. So um, what he did is he got involved with, uh, he's worked with communities across the state on branding and using iconic images and colors to create signage in downtowns. Um, so they've, they've been a great team. They're probably about, would you say three quarters of the way through? your project, um, and they've been wonderful. We've had a great committee of volunteers that have been um, kind of their sounding board. Um, and so we had one public outreach meeting, um, I think a few of you were there on Hamilton Street in the one of the storefronts there um, to gather a lot of input from townspeople. And then tonight, the purpose of this is for this team to kind of present the results of a market analysis that they did, a very deep market analysis. You saw kind of the output out there, but they're going to go into detail and kind of make sense of it for you. And then we're going to, after that, um, show you some of those graphics and um, designs of potential signage for downtown that we'll ask you to vote on. So um, I think I'll just, at this point, just kind of give it to, to Eric from RKG. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks for uh, joining us on this Friday evening. Uh, as Rosemary mentioned, my name is Eric Halverson. I'm with RKG Associates. Just a quick background on us. Um, we've been around for about 35 years. We're now based uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, and the office that I work out of is in downtown Boston. Um, we specialize in uh, real estate economics, economic development, and general community planning. So we do everything from master plans all the way down to site level uh, development feasibility analyses and everything in between. So we work at a lot of different scales. Um, but one of the kind of bread and butter of the company is doing these economic development plans for towns. Um, and Daphne's here as well. She's been helping us with the community engagement component. And Hopefully we'll see Mark um, shortly. I'm assuming that he's stuck somewhere on the highway and isn't answering his phone because he doesn't want to get into any trouble with his car. Um, but he's going to be here tonight at some point to share some of the um, initial ideas for the branding and the signage program um, for Southbridge, which I think you'll find really interesting. Is this okay? Okay, great. So I thought um, it, the July meeting, I know uh, I recognize a couple of the faces from there. We didn't give too much of an overview on the process itself, sort of what we're doing and some of the findings that we've had, because we want it to be kind of a fun and interactive event with the, with the musicians and the artists and the food and everything. So this one's going to be a little bit more heavier um, on sort of process and what we found, which I hope will be, uh, will be interesting for you all. Um, 
So just a little bit, I mean, this is really a framework for trying to increase the commercial tax base, bring, uh, you know, supporting the existing businesses that are here in town, bringing new businesses into town, um, and trying to create new jobs in Southbridge. That's really the backbone of what uh, the economic development plan is trying to do. Um, sort of the process and the tasks, there's four main components that we've outlined with the town. The first was a demographic and economic profile, so sort of looking at who's living here, who's working here, what businesses are here today. The next piece... Yay! Yes. Okay. So then the market assessment, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, Mark's going to touch on the rebranding campaign in a bit with some of his designs. And then um, the kind of last 25% that Rosemary was mentioning is really looking at the strategies and the recommendations for how to take all this information and then how the town, along with their partners, businesses, property owners, um, and other entities in town can actually continue to build the economic development and the commercial base in town. So just, I'm going to go through some of this pretty quickly. Um, it's kind of general, uh, but the demographic and economic profile was really the first component. So what we found, um, and a lot of this kind of plays into the market base here in Southbridge, so that's why we do it. Um, but since the year 2000, the number of people, so the number of residents in Southbridge and the number of households have, have been declining. Um, and what we do a lot of times is we'll compare whichever town we're working in to kind of larger geographies to see whether or not is that an anomaly or is that what's happening across the region or across the state. And in fact, um, probably as many of you know, um, Southbridge is a bit different from the larger central Massachusetts region and the state as a whole. When you look at um, estimated population growth out to the year 2020, the central mass region is expected to grow by about 14% and the state by about 8%. But what we see in Southbridge is basically relatively flat. So it's not really going to gain that much and it's not going to really lose that much. It's just kind of where it is, um, you know, over the next five or six years. Um, in terms of uh, the ages, so we also look at the age of folks who are living here. Um, interestingly, Southbridge has kind of a growing age group of 25 to 34 year olds. And much like the rest of the state and many other places around the country, it also has a growing um, aging population, those who are over the age of 65. And from an economic development standpoint, it's kind of interesting because um, Typically what we see is those over the age of 65 end up switching from um, a wage-based income or a salary-based income over to a fixed income. Therefore, their spending power on things like retail or services in a town or in a region are not as high as folks who are actively in the workforce. So that's something um, worth noting. But the good thing about Southbridge is that kind of beginning of the workforce, the 25 to 34, um, some of the beginning years of the prime earning years is sort of growing in Southbridge, which is good. So if those folks are, those folks are employed, they're hopefully going to be then contributing to the local economy. Um, Southbridge uh, is unique, I think, for Central Mass, maybe outside of Worcester, has a really growing, a large growing base of a uh, of racially and ethnically diverse population, which is great. Um, unfortunately, for at least from what we've seen, it's not necessarily represented in the business community or hasn't been through this process, but it's good to know that that base is there. And I think that's something the town could really capitalize on and market as something very diverse and unique um, within the Central Mass area. And um, interestingly, Southbridge residents are less likely to have a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree compared to the larger region of the state. And we, when we were talking with some of the business owners, particularly those in the manufacturing industries, um, that seems to be um, kind of a sticking point for them because they're looking for employees to backfill some of the older generation employees that they've had for a while. And the kind of lack of that secondary education is an issue for them. And I know that the businesses and um, the community college are starting to partner together for these unique training programs, which which is really great to hear. So I think that'll help fill some of that gap. Um, just a couple of other facts. Um, in terms of median household income, uh, Southbridge is a little bit below the region in the state. You can see that in the graph over to the right. Um, typical median income for a household is about $20,000 less in Southbridge than it is in the region or the state. Um, unemployment in Southbridge is about 2% higher um, than it is at the state, but the good news is that's coming down actually quite significantly over the last couple years. Um, we also looked at the industry mix in Southbridge, um, the industries that tend to be located here now um, that have the, the highest number of employees tend to be in the healthcare and kind of the social assistance industries and also in manufacturing. Um, and when we looked at, uh, of the folks who are employed 
are who are residents in Southbridge and are in the workforce, so the working residents, only about 22% of residents in Southbridge who are working actually work in Southbridge. A lot of them, you know, 80 or 70 Eight percent of them are actually going out to other communities for work, and a lot of them are actually employed in the retail and service sector industries, and they're and they're going out. Um, which you know, the retail base here in Southbridge, restaurants, retail and services, isn't as great as it is in some of the other places around here. So that kind of makes sense. Um, but when you look at the healthcare, the social assistance, and the manufacturing industries, those industries that are located in Southbridge are importing a lot of workers from other places, which I think shows the mismatch between what the employment base needs here in Southbridge and where they're getting their employees from. Uh, just a little bit about um, housing and cost of living. Um, the median home value in Southbridge, which is shown over on the graph on the right, is quite a bit lower than the region and the state. Um, we've talked a little bit about this throughout the process. So I personally think that that's could be a good thing, especially when you're trying to attract employees in here. The, the housing stock um, for the most part is pretty good. Most of it's in good condition, especially the single family housing stock. So trying to attract people in with a lower cost um, from housing, we know that in the state of Massachusetts, housing is extremely expensive and oftentimes a pretty big barrier for bringing workers in. But I don't think that's necessarily an issue here in Southbridge. Um, Property taxes, however, are quite a bit higher than a lot of the surrounding towns, and they've increased about 34% over the last five years. So it might be something that the town wants to think about. Um, and then the, we've heard a lot about the quality and the reputation of the public schools as kind of as being something that disadvantages the town. But um, there's a lot of hope going forward with the moves that the state are making with the, with the public school district. So that's something I think an opportunity to look forward to. So that's just a little bit of kind of setting the baseline here in Southbridge so that we as sort of outsiders can understand um, what's going on and how that might impact the future of the market. So the second piece, um, which I think will be new to a lot of you, um, other than those who are on the committee, is the piece about market assessment. So what we did was we wanted to ask a couple of key questions. Um, what's the supply and the demand for space in Southbridge? And that's sort of square footage or residential units in Southbridge. So we looked at the industrial market, the office market, the retail market, and then the residential market as part of the assessment. We also are looking at what industries uh, and or retailers might locate in Southbridge. And then finally, where are the opportunities in Southbridge for future economic development? And that could be helping the existing buildings grow and expand, or the existing businesses rather, grow and expand who are here already. Or it could be how do we attract new businesses um, to some of these different areas in town. So on the retail uh, piece, we'll start with that one. So some of the keys to retail growth, probably not surprising. We always start with the mantra of rooftops before retail. Retail is really supported a lot of times primarily by the folks who live in the community where the retail is located, unless you're one of the communities who are fortunate to have some kind of an attractant, whether it, maybe it's a regional mall, it's an out set of outlets, or you're just a town or a city that a lot of people want to come to for another reason and happen to shop there. I think in Southbridge, the way it is today, it's really the rooftops uh, before retail seems to be the mantra because people who live here tend to support the retail and the businesses that are here. Um, you know, unless you have a very special bike store where people are coming from all over the place uh, to check out. Uh, also, we look at the daytime employment uh, population. So in addition to the residents who live here, there's also people who are coming from outside to work in Southbridge. They're shopping, they're eating, they're spending money in the town. And then um, also, are there things uh, that are attracting regional spending to support the retail base? So again, is there some kind of tourism industry in the town? Um, is there some other kind of attractor in the town that's bringing people from outside in? So when we go back and talk about the projections for Southbridge, thinking about the demographics piece that we just talked about, the population um, has been declining over the last 10 years and it's projected to basically show little growth uh, in population and households. So when you think back to the first bullet point, rooftops before retail in Southbridge, at this point in time, at least over the next couple of years, probably the population base, the resident base that you have is probably what the retailers are gonna have. Um, so I think it's important to then look at how do you either increase that or how do you start to think about bringing people from the outside into Southbridge if the retail base and the restaurant base and other things are going to grow over time. So one way we try to get at uh, the retail component of the market analysis is to do what we call a retail gap study. 
And if you boil it down, it basically looks at one thing. It looks at what's the supply of retail in your town. And retail in this instance is, um, is stores, but it's also uh, restaurants and drinking establishments as well. So what's the supply? How much square footage in different retail categories does Southbridge have today? And then we look at the demand, which is how much money is being spent by Southbridge residents on those different retail categories. So when you compare the supply, how much do you have to the demand, how much is being spent, and you subtract those two, it gives you a gap. So if there are way, way more boutique clothing stores than there is money being spent on boutique clothing stores, it means you have an oversupply. And if there's not enough boutique clothing stores and people are going to Sturbridge or somewhere else to spend money on boutique clothing, then you have a gap. So that's essentially how it works. And this is really just a tool, I think, for the town, uh, property owners, business owners, brokers to use to go out and shop around for businesses where there are vacancies in the town. So what we usually look at is um, we do a radius around a certain point in the town to figure out how many people are living within that radius, how much money they're spending, and then how much supply of retail is there. Um, so for Southbridge, we use the center point of right in downtown. I think we used 346 Main Street. And then uh, the program that we use basically draws concentric circles, one at three miles, one at five miles, and one at 10 miles. Um, for what I'm gonna show you tonight, we really focus on the three mile radius. Um, because that I think is where the highest opportunities are for capturing the people who are really living in Southbridge and working in Southbridge. Three miles covers just about all of Southbridge for the most part. Five miles really starts to get out into the, some of the surrounding towns. And 10 miles is really only used if you're trying to do a market study where you're trying to attract people from a really large area, um, something like a regional mall or some kind of regional tourism attraction. So for this, we'll just focus on the three mile, um, but in our report, we'll have the information on all of them. So this was out on the, in the hall, if anybody had a chance to take a look. Um, it's really interesting. There's a lot of what we call sales leakage. So that's people who live within that three mile area, but are going elsewhere to buy goods and to buy goods, to take care of services and to eat and drink. Um, the numbers in the third column here basically shows the gap, what we call the over under. So the things that are in red are where there's a lot of leakage, which translates into opportunities. And I think when we think about Southbridge, um, one of the things that I noticed when I was in the downtown, there's not a ton, I'll just use this as an example, there's not a lot of full service restaurants, full service kind of sit down restaurants where you could go sit down, somebody serves you, you have a nice meal. And I think that's backed up nicely um, by the data. There's a huge gap, there's about an $11 million, almost $12 million spending gap there on restaurants. And when you look at full service restaurants, it's almost $9 million. Um, that usually doesn't mean a lot to people in terms of the money. I mean, who knows how much 11 or eight or $2 million is. So what we do is we um, generate a sales per square foot for all these different retail categories. And we translate that into the number of potential supportable square feet that might, you might see. So for full service restaurants, if there's a $9 million gap and you were able to capture that $9 million worth of spending in somewhere in Southbridge or in the downtown, that could potentially equate to about 20,000 square feet of new restaurants. So if you think about a typical restaurant size in a downtown, maybe it's, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 square feet, could be a little smaller, or a little bit bigger. So that does have the potential of maybe somewhere in the range of eight to 11 new restaurants. There's that sort of spending that's going elsewhere, that's leaving Southbridge. I think it's unrealistic to assume Southbridge will capture 100% of the sales leakage because somebody might love a restaurant in Southbridge, or, excuse me, in Sturbridge or in Dudley or somewhere else, and they're going to continue to go there pretty much unless that restaurant moved into Southbridge, which is possible, but unlikely. So what we use is sort of a 30 to 40% capture rate. So we might say that that 20,000 is maybe six, seven, 8,000, which might equate to somewhere between four and six or five and seven new restaurants. Still a lot of potential for the downtown, just using restaurants as an example. Um, you can see there's a lot of other retail categories that are in red here. Um, so in terms of retail, per, you know, retail kind of capture, if the town was able to capture more of that spending here. Um, there is a lot of potential. So when we also looked at, at office and industrial. Um, the current office market is mostly class B and class C space. Um, 
retail brokers will usually break it down. A is the best, highest finishes, nicest buildings. B is kind of in the middle. C is uh, at the bottom. Um, there's a lot of B and C on the market today in, in Southbridge. Uh, and it's actually all over the place. It's a mix of small professional offices that are on the market and mid-size offices, things kind of in the 10 to 20,000 square foot range. And a lot of them are being marketed as part of industrial spaces, existing industrial spaces. So there may be a manufacturing component at one time in the past, and then they had a front office space where they're doing their admin work or their computing work, um, and all the things are being built in the back. So those spaces are, there's quite a few of them in town. And the rents are relatively cheap. They range anywhere from $5 a square foot per year up to almost $12 um, for the kind of smaller spaces in town. So when you look at it regionally, the rents are, are quite reasonable. Um, but I think that's because a lot of the spaces are Class C and would need some work if someone was going to go in and try to retrofit them um, and renovate them. Um, and right now we found between some online research and um, some of the properties being marketed by brokers and by the town, there's about five um, office spaces being actively marketed um, in town today. So in our opinion, if they're the office market, I think if there was any demand out there for new office space, a lot of it could actually just be captured in the existing vacancies today. We don't necessarily see brand new office being built in town. I think a lot of it will be captured through the redevelopment or the renovation of existing spaces, with the exception of if you got a single big tenant that really wanted their own kind of signature building um, and they wanted to locate somewhere in town, that could be an opportunity. But quite honestly, those are really few and far between. Um, and they tend to locate in uh, close proximity to highway networks and transportation networks. And Southbridge is set a little bit off of 84 and a little bit off of the pike. But not that it couldn't happen. Um, on the industrial side, uh, obviously, I think we're adjacent to probably one of the biggest opportunities in Southbridge, the old AO complex. Um, there's, I think, close to 180 or 200,000 square feet of um, vacant industrial space and a little bit of office being marketed today between um, all the buildings that are out on the campus. <clears throat> There's a mix of small, mid, and large-scale industrial and research and development spaces in town. And the rents, again, are really low. They're anywhere from about $2.50 a square foot to as high as $6 from the market research that we were able to do. And from what we saw, there's about six or so industrial spaces being actively marketed um, across the town. I think this kind of offers a unique opportunity for the town because industrial could be used, it's kind of a catch-all term, it could be used creatively for almost anything. It could be used for traditional manufacturing, um, which was being done in the town and, and, quite, and still is being done in the town today. Um, it could be used as um, creative sort of maker space. I know Somerville had, uh, over in the Boston area, the city of Somerville had an interesting industrial space kind of in the middle of the city that nobody really knew what to do with. And a bunch of artists came in and they created this huge uh, workspace and um, they hold classes. They rent small spaces to local artists. Um, they have metalworking, jewelry making, painting, 3D printing, you name it, they have it out there. Um, and it was just a really kind of innovative and smart way to reuse what probably otherwise may have just been torn down and turned into more million dollar condos. Um, so maybe Southbridge thinks about something like that as kind of a creative use for some of the industrial space. Um, I know in talking with some folks in town, um, that I know that uh, the, the complex is also kind of being talked about as maybe having housing as well. So if there's office, there's housing, there's kind of light industrial or light manufacturing that's not heavy on noise or on um, uh, kind of air pollution, that could be another use that maybe somebody comes in and transfers uh, that over to some of that over to residential. Residential. So as I mentioned before, um, there hasn't been a lot of growth uh, over the last couple of years. There's actually been some decline in the number of households in town. I think a lot of this, um, the two graphs on the right kind of show a time series from 2000 to 2015. The one on the top is um, the total number of residential sales in town, both condos and single family homes. The graph on the bottom is the medium, median sales value. And I think you'll notice a trend that happens in the sort of 2005, 2006 time frame here where everything takes a dip. I think we all probably know what that was related to, the Great Recession. But if you look across many uh, Massachusetts cities and towns, um, after about 2008, 2009, it starts to come back up again. Massachusetts was fortunate to recover quite quickly from that. Um, unfortunately, Southbridge is, is still trying to recover from that. Um, residential sales have remained relatively steady um, over that time. Single family has actually seen a pretty big boost, which is good. It's kind of coming back. 
but values are still are still down quite a bit. And again, as I mentioned before, some see that as a positive, some see that as a negative. It depends on how you look at it. I think it's I think it's a good thing that the housing prices are at least affordable. Um, but over time, since the population isn't necessarily expected to grow, uh, we don't see a big residential market here. Um, I think one of the unique opportunities is thinking about um, attracting the younger workforce and then supporting the um, people who are trying to age in place here. Um, I think smaller multifamily units could work well here. I think um, thinking about the mixed use idea in downtown, um, I think as the first floor retail um, starts to pan out over time, getting those upper stories um, and marketing those to the younger folks who might want to live in downtown, live in kind of a more urban, um, upbeat, interesting, vibrant uh, downtown area could be a really good market opportunity. So I don't know if you'll see a lot of new units, but I think the refurbishing of stuff that's here today could be a really good opportunity in Southbridge. So that's a little bit about the analysis, the demographic and the economic piece and the market piece. So what we wanted to move into um, this evening is talking a little bit about the townwide strategies. So the economic development strategies the town could use and then looking specifically at four opportunity areas um, for economic development, which we've been talking with the committee about quite a bit lately. So this isn't meant to be exhaustive. It's just meant to kind of give you a flavor of some of the direction as to what we might be talking to the town about in the next month or so. Um, so these are just a list of townwide strategies. These were also outside if you wanted to take a closer look. Um, I think one thing that we heard a lot about when we did some of the initial interviews with property owners and business owners was the idea of the town um, kind of acting in concert with them and with brokers um, to help market some of the larger properties in town to people who might be interested in that. Um, Daphne and I are doing a plan, a master plan in Kittery, Maine, and we're doing the economic development section. One thing that the um, economic development committee there did um, in concert with the town planning department was they created their own marketing page for the town of Kittery. It's actually even nicer than the town's webpage. It's quite nice. And on there, they talk about all the different things, um, all the different amenities that Kittery offers, but then they have a whole dedicated section to um, properties and buildings that are being marketed in the town and also vacant land. They have a business park, um, probably about 80 acres um, that is just sitting there. Do we have internet access? Yes. We could show that afterwards, yeah. Um, and I was thinking that that's also similar to the industrial park on the north side of town where the town has town on land that they're marketing. So that could be an interesting opportunity and an interesting partnership between the town, property owners, business owners, et cetera, to try and market the town further. And I think the work that Mark's doing on the branding um, could also translate nicely into that as well. Um, the work um, supporting the expansion of the community college and the and the job training program I think is critical to getting um, students who are coming out of high school um, who might not be going on to four-year uh, colleges and universities but want to enter the workforce um, getting them into that program getting them trained up and then also training uh, the existing employees on some of the new technology will be very important to keep those businesses viable in Southbridge um, Mark's going to talk about branding the town um, more than I can um, I think promoting the access and the connections to the assets in town. Um, you know, Southbridge is about 17,000 people. It has city infrastructure, but it's a town setting. I'm not sure I've seen a lot of places like this. I think it's very unique. There's water, there's sewer. Those are two huge things for businesses. There's an airport. Not many municipalities have an airport. Um, you're not far from 84 and 90. Um, I think the roadway infrastructure in town, the sidewalks in town is very unique for a town of this size as well. Um, you have a hospital in town and a fairly, a fairly sizable healthcare um, network here. So I think sort of marketing those things to people, uh, the river as well, I almost forgot about the river, hopefully the future rail trail. So, I mean, the town's got a lot of really good ideas It's sort of just how to, how to bring all those things together and execute them. Um, when we look at some of the older historic structures and some of the economic development areas, I think taking a look at the zoning that's in place is really critical and trying to make that zoning as flexible as possible. Um, in my opinion, in a place like Southbridge, there's probably going to be some really creative ideas that come out at some point. I know some of that's already happening with, um, say, like the Starlight Lounge, for example. There's a lot of different things that happen in that space that are sort of creative and I think new. And, and I'm hoping that more of that comes out over time. So the ability for the town to be flexible and help creative people do what they 
want to do as long as it's legal and it's safe um, but trying to help them do what they want to do to revitalize the town will be really important and zoning is can be a really critical tool in that um, as can a streamlined permitting process maybe a little bit more so for bigger developments or bigger businesses trying to get them through the permitting process as quickly as possible time means money so to those businesses if you're able to say we'll get you in and out of the process in 60 days or 30 days or whatever it is we're better than all the other towns around us it'll take you six months to get through your, their permitting process that's a really big selling point for businesses as well and then i think the final point i would make is um the town may want to this would take a bigger um, bigger discussion, I think, at the council level, but think about tax relief. Um, I know a lot of towns will use tax relief to try and encourage specific types of developments in specific locations. I know, fortunately, you have Rosemary on staff now. She's an expert in what they call TIF, um, tax increment financing. It's what she used to do. Um, so that might be something the town uh, might want to consider, um, specifically maybe up at the industrial park um, or in the downtown to try and get um, businesses in. And then also improving the relationship with the Latino business community and trying to encourage more Latino owned businesses to open in Southbridge, um, I think is really important. The town of Framingham um, has been very successful in doing this with the Brazilian community there. If you walk down the street, they have all kinds of restaurants um, from Central and South America, not just Brazilian. And I think it gives a really unique flavor that for, uh, to Framingham. And it's just something that you don't really see, I think, outside of there, at least in that larger Metro West region. So I'm wondering if, if that can be further encouraged in downtown Southbridge, getting um, Latino business owners to, you know, to take the next step and to open up um, some unique kind of businesses in the downtown. I think it could be really cool. So just quickly, um, the first area, so now we're going to try and drill down a little bit. So that was townwide. We're going to talk a little bit about the four areas. Um, these focus areas tend to be where commercial zoning or industrial zoning is already in place and where the town already either has businesses or is trying to encourage more of that. So this is what we're calling the, the East Gateway. So this is just on the east side of downtown along East Main Street. Um, right now, it's kind of the east entrance to South Bridge from Dudley. And as you're driving in, well, quite honestly, it's not very interesting. It's you know, you just sort of drive in and then you're in downtown. So are there ways to sort of to make that more interesting? Um, there's commercial development already on the north side. Um, there's sort of, there's a couple businesses and industrial sites along the south side. And just in case you didn't know, this is sort of the area of Big Y, the Big Y complex, um, the Ocean State job lot, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts. So just to zoom in, this is what we were going over with the committee um, earlier in the month. We were talking to them about some of the opportunity areas. Um, the rail trail, I think, stops just on the edge of this, and the plan is to continue it through at some point to downtown, which I think would be great. Um, there's also the river that borders on the north and the east side of this gateway. But right now, along the river, you know, you have commercial development, which I think is fine, but you also have this an auto yard right along the river um, and to think about you know when that if and when that turns over or other ways the town could encourage that to turn over into something else this could be a really great um, waterfront opportunity and then along the south side there's a couple of redevelopment opportunities here this is kind of a, a fenced off property it's not not exactly sure what that's being used for what is it the yeah the gas company um, and then you have a lot of auto-oriented auto businesses. You have a gas station, you have some repair shops um, that kind of all have their own parking lots. They have a whole bunch of entrances all off there. It's not very pedestrian friendly um, in this area. So are there ways to think about signage and streetscape treatments, consolidating some of those parking lots, increasing the landscaping in the area, just to make it a nicer gateway? You know, kind of some short-term things that the town and businesses could do while waiting for, um, for redevelopment and turnover. And this just kind of goes over some of those ideas. Uh, the second area is on the west side of downtown. We're calling the West Gateway. This is the area where Big Bunny is, fins and tails. Um, A&M Tool, we, we even incorporated the, the mills along Mill Street where A&M is. <clears throat> so in this area, um, again, could you think about landscaping? Could you think about gateway features? What's the, uh, the long-term opportunity of all that mill space? I think similar to the AO complex, there's a lot of vacancy in this area as well. So is this a creative opportunity? Um, it's within walking distance to the downtown for um, you know, something that's a little bit different. Could this be kind of creative space, maker space, um, since it's already industrial today? I think there's a really great opportunity for this site here 
right in between Fins and Tails and Empire Buffet, um, which is a pretty big vacancy. Great building here on the corner, really nice design. Um, so is there a way to kind of continue that streetscape as a gateway into downtown? And again, just thinking about, I think thinking about the zoning um, is really important in these areas to try, and, to try and promote, you know, what the town wants to see in terms of redevelopment opportunities. Okay, then the downtown. I probably don't need to talk about where this is. So we'll go right into it. Lots of opportunities here, um, particularly in what I would call the core of downtown. There's a lot of vacancies there. But then again, a lot of opportunity for retail, for mixed use, um, trying to think creatively about how to fill those vacancies. One idea might be um, to allow pop-ups to try and talk with the property owners to allow temporary infrastructure to go in there. So it could be a pop-up art gallery, it could be a pop-up restaurant, it could be a pop-up clothing boutique. This stuff's happening all over the place. There's no reason why it couldn't happen here in Southbridge. And the idea is to get people in there and populating that space, get people to come to the downtown to check it out um, and start to get downtown on the map a bit more than it is today. Um, the gateway into downtown on the east side where the Cumberlands uh, was recently constructed. Um, there's a lot of kind of what we call single use retailers. So a, a single building with one retailer, or one user in there kind of surrounded by a sea of parking. Is there a way to sort of change that over time to make it more, um, I guess from a design perspective, more like what you see in the downtown today? Um, you also are in extremely close proximity to where we are today, the hotel and conference center. Um, and also the common, but in my opinion, at least, it, the two don't really seem connected. Where we are today seems kind of over here and the downtown is over there. Um, there's an interesting utility corridor that runs between the two. So is there a way to maybe think about using that differently for a pedestrian or a bike connection so that people who are staying here at the hotel could also frequent downtown and vice versa? So just some ideas that we had there. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about the AO. Uh, campus, which is also in really close proximity, um, not only to where we are now at the conference center, but also to downtown. So think about that link as well. And then uh, up to the north, the airport and industrial park. Um, there's a lot of interesting users up here. Uh, you have Casella, um, you also have the airport, and then you have um, some of the newer industrial opportunities up there. I think it's interesting, the town's already um, put all the infrastructure in place, the water's up there, the sewer's up there, the road infrastructure's up there. So now it's just waiting for um, you know, bringing in the new users um, onto the town-owned land. So here, I'm thinking about the airport, I think as an asset. There's already a, a small restaurant cafe space up there. Um, they're investing in new hangar space. There's already a top-notch flight school up there. So what else can happen up there? Are there ways to, I think some of the committee members talked about events, uh, maybe Balloon Fest or um, uh, air, like a small air show or something like that up there to bring more people up there. Um, how do you also attract additional business um, into the park? This is where I think maybe tax increment financing could be um, an opportunity. Uh, we also heard early on that some of the hookup fees for the sewer were a little bit expensive. So is there a way to then work with the town um, to think about, is there a way to cut that down a little bit or to share some of that cost um, if that's something that's keeping businesses out? Um, one other thing um, that might be useful up here is to consider the creation of what they call a 43D district. It's a state um, designation that a lot of towns use when they have either vacant space or um, developable land and it essentially guarantees the uh, developer or the property owner, whoever it might be, a streamlined development process that you'll get in and out of that permitting process within a set period of time. And then the state will also help you do some of that marketing um, through their 43D websites. So their reach goes a little bit broader than maybe what the town um, might be able to do. So that could be something interesting to uh, consider for up there in terms of marketing and, and getting new business in there. So that's just a little bit about where we're at, some of the ideas um, that we've come up with, certainly not an exhaustive list, and we'll be going over a longer list with the committee um, when we meet again later this month, but wanted to kind of give you a flavor of where the study's going, some of the things that we've learned, um, and some of the ideas that we're going to be presenting to the town for consideration and incorporation into the report. Um, Mark, do you want to go or do you want to do questions or anything? Uh, we'll do some questions, sure. Anybody have any thoughts on strategies or any questions or just thoughts in general about 
the work. I know you all live slash work or own businesses here. So I'd love to hear what you think. Um, so there's a lot of different ways it could be funded. It could be funded completely privately. Somebody comes in and purchases a building and redevelops it or rehabs it. Um, if the building is historic in nature, uh, the town could work in a public-private partnership to get uh, the developer historic tax credits um, through the state. That could be an opportunity. Um, if the town could provide zoning incentives or tax incentives, um, and the town in the case of town-owned land, um, I've seen some communities that um, will offer that land at a pretty steep discount to try and encourage the type of development that they want to see there. So sometimes they might do a request for proposals process where they put out an RFP and development entities will respond to the town with ideas. Um, and then the town might partner in sort of a public-private partnership um, with the future developer. So there's a lot of different ways. And I think in just being creative and, and open to that is really important. two levels of um, historic tax credits at the federal and the state level and together the c it can be worth 40% of a, of a project um, and it tends to only make sense when the project is fairly large so like a mill redevelopment um, is kind of an ideal thing and in fact I just met with um, a couple of uh, experts in the state they're a couple of the top experts um, and and linked them with a, um, a large um, building owner um, in town and um, they're they're all very excited about the potential there um, the smaller buildings in downtown is just a little bit trickier but you do have to get creative because even cities like Worcester have the same issue where the uh, rental um, revenue that you can um, ask for that you can get um, in town in downtown doesn't necessarily match what it would cost to re you know completely rehab a building so you just you have to get creative and I and I can be the the uh, the link to some of those programs like the um, tax incremental financing um, and I've already talked to some business owners um, in town about this basically what it means is that if uh, someone um, builds a new building or they um, let's say expand the footprint of a building or they completely rehab it um, that's obviously going to increase the assessed value of that property which is good for the town um, but um, it, you know immediately having a higher tax bill um, it is a little bit tough for that person that just invested all that money so a TIF as they call it is um, a way to reduce or exempt the new ta property taxes that are being created by, by that investment, um, but it's it's making that project happen that wouldn't otherwise happen, and it's allowing that investor to take that money that they would have had to pay in taxes and put it back into their business and create more jobs. So it's really a win-win, and um, as Eric mentioned, I um, administered that program for um, all the communities in Central Mass for about five years, and I'm just dying to use this um, program for businesses in town. In fact, Southbridge has provided TIFs, maybe four or five in the past, at least. So um, th those are just some examples. Any other thoughts? Um, so we have a, a number of, um, we have zoning, or I'm sorry, we have a signage bylaw. We have, um, you know, a lot of things that are just part of the building code. Um, we have design guidelines. Um, part of the problem um, has been uh, a lack of capacity in town to actually enforce the regulations that we have. We're working on that. So I'm a full-time 
economic development person. We didn't have that in the town ever before. We had one individual whose job it was to be the town planner, to administer the community development block grants, and her, in her spare time be the economic development person. There was no way one person could do that. So of course then what suffers is the proactive economic development type of work and, and trying to hold people's feet to the fire to do the things they're supposed to do if it's not a safety issue. Um, the other problem is we had a, a building um, commissioner that um, was uh, part-time over the last couple of years. Um, he has now um, retired fully and we now have a full-time building inspector. We now have a blight bylaw that has just been approved by town council. Um, so we are we are already doing some of those things really holding people's feet to the fire and we're going to continue to do that and I think once you start doing that um, businesses and you start finding um, businesses business owners, tenants, and property owners start to realize everything doesn't go here. You, there are rules and you're gonna be held accountable. So, so we're working on that. We've also talked about how other municipalities um, actually provide support to business owners and in the form of seminars, in the form of teaching them how to do these things and showing them how they can meet the expectations of the rules. Because sometimes it's a gap in you know, in that area. So are you saying the town will enforce this by law? Yes, yes. Is there it a plan of when that will happen? I've heard this for a long time, the safety, absentee landlords in this town. Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. <laughs> oh, the absentee landlords in this town are just everywhere. Um, you know, on Central Street next to my building, that has been unsafe, uh, unsightly, half burnt down for a decade. So, you know, if, if you're gonna enforce it, that's great. Um, do they know when they're gonna start enforcing that? So, the, the blight bylaw was just approved by town council, um, and it's coincided with, and we, we actually have a town councilor here, Miguel Rivera, so you know that it was just, um, approved um, and that actually um, there were a number of regulations that we already had in town but what that does is it takes all of those and puts it in one very visible bylaw and says exactly what it is um, and it just got approved and it coincided with us getting a full-time very experienced building inspector so we do uh, plan on doing proactive inspections and um, you know finding First you, you know, you have to have an audit trail, first you have to give a warning, and then you find, but that's absolutely, our town manager is very business friendly, and he, he pushed that um, very early on, and I was part of the committee that put that together, so we, we do, and I, I know exactly what building you're talking about. And um, the other thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to work with some of these absentee landlords and say, okay, if you, and, and I, 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 I want to be diplomatic, but firm, if you're not planning on investing in your buildings, then let me help you sell it to someone that does care, has some pride, and cares about the town. And that's, and I'm, I've already started doing that. Um, and with, in fact, the owner of that building. So um, we're really working, we're really gonna work on that. And I completely understand your frustration because we're very frustrated too. <laughs> Anything else? Should we go to Mark? All right. Do you need anything from me? Uh, not yet, no. So I'll, I'll, I'll put them up. This is going to be a more interactive process, so it means you're going to have to stand up and stretch and walk down and take a look at things. But I'll, I'll give you a little background on what we were trying to do here. Um, Community branding or, or urban branding or neighborhood branding is sort of a new term. And uh, uh, it's not, in, a, in essence, something you would learn in a business school. And you uh, might not learn it where I went to school for uh, uh, urban design and, and urban planning. But somehow, if we can combine certain aspects of both of those, we can come up with what is a community brand. Now, 
Southbridge is one of 17 that I'm working on or have worked on in the Commonwealth in the last two or three years. Um, we do a process and the advisory committee uh, worked very diligently with me and we uh, came up with a, an approach to think about what should be the uh, look or the, the brand of uh, Southbridge. And we had something we called an ideation exercise, and I'm going to we'll turn on the lights and you can come over and read it. And these are the words and phrases that we came up with as a group. Now, what I'm asking you to do is if you have any additional ideas, please uh, write them down today and leave them with Rosemary. And, uh, but anyway, you'll see what we tried to come up with. Now, some of it was how do you describe in positive ways uh, Southbridge with one word? And after they got frustrated with that after a while, how about two words? And then what about three or more words? And then we talked about what would the colors be if we were talking about branding? Or what would the symbols be and what would the future be? So those are certain ways to think about how do you, how do you brand. Then it was up to my firm, and we're part of the team, to try to translate some of these terms into some visuals. So we have two um, distinct ones with a couple variations we want you to look at. And do you have the um, post-it notes. Post notes? Okay. And dots. We want you to vote on some of these today. So as I said, this is the most interactive part of it. Now, community branding is about developing character. What is the character of a place? Now, we translate that character into wayfinding and signage and directional signage. And that's called comfort, because if you're a new resident or newcomer, it gives you comfort to find your way around. And that reinforces the character by giving you a fresh look at things. Then we're going to hopefully, when it's decided, apply that to uh, social media in the form of maybe a Facebook page um, for businesses or maybe a Facebook page for the t to town itself, or also um, uh, on the uh, Southbridge main uh, website, we will have the same character or brand connected. So it'll be a consistent look to it as a, if a corporation was doing it. So I would like you to take a look at some of these, vote on some of the things that you see, ask me questions. And uh, it's a less formal presentation than the earlier one, which I thought was very good, by the way. And uh, you want to applaud Eric? And, Daph and, and Daphne as well, who has been. So um, I'm going to put these up here. We're going to turn on the lights. And please feel free to come by, ask questions, make comments. Um, unlike a, a piece of art, uh, design is something that needs the client. So you're not going to insult me in any way if you say, I don't like this, or could you try something else? So. Uh, art, if you paint a picture and you make the sky pink, uh, that's what the artist says. And if somebody says, I don't like it, then they don't buy it. But in design, if you paint it pink and they say, I'd like it blue, the client's right, so you make it blue. So thank you, and, and uh, we'll be around for a while, right, to talk about it. Yes, so sure. Okay. So do you want me to help you put these up? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I have some sticky dots. I'll give each person a sticky dot when they come down. Take a look at uh, the poster boards that Mark's putting up now. And if you would use your sticky dot to share your preference on which one of the two different designs you think sort of best fits or represents with, with what Mark was talking about. We also have um, some sticky notes if you don't like something, or you do like something, or you have a different suggestion, we really do want to hear that so we can incorporate it into the next round of designs that Mark's going to come up with for the town and the committee. So this is, like Mark said, the interactive piece. We really want to hear your feedback um, and your ideas on the designs. Yeah. Well, I, want, I want to explain one, one more thing, if I can. Um, in this particular case, we have a, um, a metal band 
that we can build on. Um, there's one more abstracted one, and there's one that looks like a pair of eyeglasses. And the idea is that maybe fencing and gateways and all kinds of things can come out of this or the back of a bench. So it could be part of the, the brand uh, and, and, and as part of the streetscape as well. So it, actually you have four choices. You have the metalwork and the two color designs. Uh, so it's two times two. Right, right. That's... It could be, you know, or a bike rack or something. Street furniture, yeah. Furniture. Yeah. You, you, you have slides. It sort of connects the dots for you. But like Mark said, it's both expressing Southridge as well as creating the expression. Creating the kind so of it's sort of a, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of you can think off the top of your head if you bring to a community that kind of has this. The bridges in Worcester are now colored. That's a, that's a good example. Yeah, okay. it's a good example. Oh, we're walking around. A lot of witches walking around, too. So. <laughs> a few warlocks. <laughs> so in the urban design sense, um, if we look at downtown uh, Southbridge, it, it, everybody would say there are good bones here. The good bones. We just have to make them a little healthier looking and a little more vibrant. Yes, sir. Sure. I, I want you to read this um, first panel, and it talks about all the words and all the things that people suggested about it. And from that, we translated that visually. And you're allowed to make your input as well. Well, I mean, that's poetic license. And if you see it, you'll kind of see how it, because we, the committee talked about colors. And they talked oh, this is good. Yeah. They've talked about all kinds of images. They've talked about, like, what are, what are words that one word that you would describe the town? One word. Okay, yeah. So if you look, and then we crossed, we, we, it was an iterative process, and then things got crossed off. If, um, we thought it was redundant or didn't quite fit. Um, and we just continued with this process and it, it kind of evolved. So strong manufacturers, natural resources, walkable downtown. Ethn I don't know if you can, I don't want to just read it to you, but I don't know how well you can see it. But these are some examples of two word kind of brainstorming things that just people said off the top of their head on this committee. And then how would you describe in three or more words, I, the Commonwealth, undeveloped open space. Uh, and you see there were a lot of opportunities. That word kept coming up. Opportunity for youth engagement, historic preservation, entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, you'll see a little further down. Um, OK, so here's the, what color are colors. So dark blue and white. Um, brick red because of the brick. Um, green, because there's a lot of trees. If you see an aerial view, um, Pete, like we saw last night, there's a lot of green here. Um, ochre, is that how you say it? Oh, and so that's um, Gabe's, the church that you rede redeveloped, which, by the way, I think is beautiful, and a lot of people do. Um, it's very vibrant, and it's very iconic. And you say, you can say, turn right at the ochre church. <laughs> um, and then the um, black for the, all the, the raw iron that are in town, that's in town, you know, that uh, some of the grants paid for in the alleyways. Um, and then what symbols express, clock tower, eyeglasses, some of the architectural elements, the town seal, evergreens, laurel. Um, and, okay, so then what would you like 
so remember, this was like very quick, so it had to be, we didn't give it a lot of thought, it had to be your gut coming from your gut. Um, so this gives you a sense of um, what came out of our, this ideation. It was about a two hour session, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that, and it was actually fun. Um, concepts and directions. So now these are the Okay, so from all of that yeah. came these designs. So please feel free to get up and, and look and and, and like questions. and so do they already have the dots or the what they need to have? They come up here, they oh, okay. If you you only get your dots if you come up, <laughs> and we can just guide you through it so you understand what we're looking for. So are th um, they're going to vote on yeah. each? Okay. Or, or indicate their preference. <coughs> so can they do it with a, just a pen? Or? No, with the dots. Okay. Oh,